I uh, put on public record my thanks to, uh, to Alan Jones and that uh, couple of weeks after uh, the last uh, election in last, uh, last August. I just wish some other people had taken advice uh, from Alan. Um, having said those things, I'll be very quick tonight. We've got five minutes. Um, um, you know, I, I have been in politics for 38, 39 years. Um, no one outranks me except for uh, one person in Sydney. Um, so I've seen many politicians. And if you would have told me that in my lifetime I would come to an area right out in the middle of nowhere like this, I would see a thousand people at a meeting here and not one single political representative of these people here, a bloke from the centre of Brisbane and a bloke from North Queensland, 3,000 kilometres away. We could see our way to being here tonight, but your representatives couldn't see their way to being here tonight. And there is no excuse for that. And if I am angry, I am entitled to be angry. And I expect backup and I expect solidarity from the people representing these areas. Having said that, um, I, I, I bring... You know, I, I, I bring to you no hope. No hope. <laughs> I bring to you no hope in the sense that I've heard Alan, you know, maybe the greatest Australian we've still got standing around the place at the present moment, uh, who has always never lost the faith and kept fighting for us. But I have heard the people in Canberra and in Brisbane in the parliament just hold the farming community and the rural community in callous contempt. I hardly give a speech now, for I don't mention that every four days in our country a farmer commits suicide and another young man hang himself from a tree in the streets of Innisfail last week. He comes from a town where we just close the sugar mill down. We close the sugar mill every year in, in, in this country now. We only get 20 left and there'll be no sugar industry, which is still a bigger employer in this state than the coal mining industry. But we don't care about that. We don't care about that. Um, within four years, our nation will become a net importer of food. Now you can use the financial reviews definition and say we're a net importer of food now or you can use another definition and say in nine years. But I think it's an accurate thing to say. Within four years we will be a net importer of food. Now if I'm not a Cloncurry boy, like, like Heather, who I, I much love over here, oh, uh, yeah. girls, yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> that's one mistake you couldn't make, could you? <laughs> um, um, but, but, but if I was a city person, from Brisbane or from Sydney, and you ask me, do I want to live in a country that can't feed itself, then I would say, I would be ashamed. I would be ashamed. Just my electorate alone, we can feed 70 million people. On the Murray-Darling experience, we have the water, we have the land up there to feed 70 million people. But all of Australia will not be able to feed 22 million people. Within four years, we have fought a war. I was handed a rifle when I was uh, a lad of 18 and a half. I was handed a rifle and told you on 24-hour call-up, give me three telephone numbers because you're going up to fight. In the Indonesians, we're at war with Indonesia <coughs> over protecting our oil supply line. We have fought a war almost every single year since 1964 and, and we are right at fighting a war now to protect our oil supply line. But infinitely more important is our food supply line, which we are simply closing down. We are simply closing down. Um, let me say, I, I was Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, I had to do an enormous amount of research to find out why our first Australians in their communities were lagging so far behind. And there was absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was because they had their land rights taken away from them and still not restored, I might add, still not restored. Um, <clears throat> if you take people's land rights away from them, their reason for getting out of bed in the morning is taken away from them. So I don't want to come here today as a politician making uh, good speeches. I want to come along here and I've asked Russell Crowder to launch my book um, because Robin Hood, the movie, King John says, what? Do you think I have the wherewithal to give every Englishman 
a castle? And Robin Hood says, every Englishman's home is his castle. <laughs> Good on you, Russell Crowe. But, but we Anglo peoples who are read, led at the present moment from a man whose forefathers came out of Africa, uh, President Obama, we Anglo peoples, you know, when the Crown decided that the Crown owned the land and we didn't, we had a very bad habit of cutting the Crown's head off. <laughs> you know, and it may be about time that we start thinking about taking some fairly uh, aggressive action. But... <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, but the story of the Magna Carta is a great story and it's about delivering to you the rights that the Crown does not own my land, I own my land. And uh, Roel Walton is the president of our new party, one of your own uh, from out here, uh, uh, Wheaton uh, and Wool Farmer. Roel said, what we are about is restoring those rights and those powers back to you. And though a lot of you will not remember this, I was appointed the Mines and Energy Minister, and I close on this note, I was appointed Mines and Energy Minister of the Queensland Government. And unfortunately, it was only two or three months before we had an election. But I inherited the rotten legislation that was put through, and I don't hesitate to say it, by the Ahern government. And we got rid of him three months before the election. But it was too late for me to be able to reverse that legislation. So what I said was that if we are re-elected, that legislation will be reversed. And the Mining Council of Australia passed a no vote of no confidence in me three weeks before the election. And they said they were going to do it. And I said, well, listen, Buster Brown, I don't threaten real good. I tell you, where I come from, you know, threats just get your back up. But, but that legislation said that if you are a freehold landowner, then miners cannot come onto your property unless they get permission from you. Now, if you say that's going to destroy mining in this state, well, the greatest period of mining development in this nation's history were the Bajocki peterson years where that legislation was in. Now, what it meant was that they had to pay you a very large sum of money if they wanted to get onto your land. So the power was restored to you, the people. And that's... I, I haven't got time to outline tonight. It's, it's five minutes and I've really got to close. <laughs> but, but, but we will be more than happy to tell you what we intend to do when we get the power, not if we get the power. And if you think that's ridiculous, well, someone was saying that. I sit under a picture of Jack McEwen and I sit under a picture of Ted Theodore. When one thirty one of us went down the mines and never came back up again, he said, we can change this. And he did. He took over the state for 50 years. Now, Jack McEwen on a dirt floor and galvanised iron, eating, living off rabbits, said, we can change this. We can form a country party. We can change this. And he did. And his final interview, they said, Mr McEwen, is it true that the country party wags the Liberal dog? Silence. Is it true that you run the government? Is it true that the country party tail wags the Liberal dog? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I conclude on this note. The most poignant scene that I ever saw, I love movies, I go to them all the time, the most poignant scene that I ever saw in a movie was the scene in Saving Private Ryan. And the Black Mariah pulls up and the camera's behind the mother and she sees the men walking up to hand her the telegram to tell her that the three sons are dead. And uh, she just, everything that was in that woman's body just crumpled. You know, everything that held her upright just crumpled and she crumpled into the floor. And it was a very poignant scene for me because my great-great-great-great-grandmother waited at the doorstep and got the letter saying that her son had died at Gallipoli. And then my great-grandmother, she stood in the doorway and got the telegram saying that her son had died in Shangi Prison. So I sit under that sign on my wall, Bert Henley, they give it to you. They're both called Bert Henley when your son relative dies in the war. I sit under those, those things that are on my wall. And we're not going to let those people down. The rights of property will be returned to you. And all we've got to do is stand on our hind legs and fight. 
And that's what we intend to do. I can promise you that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, it was, I think, the American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, and I think they've converted that into a musical, haven't they? Uh, could you please...